All right, stay tuned. Intro start. You've now tuned in to the Drawing Board Podcast, a powerful, thought-provoking discussion where we talk about family, relationships, ministry, community, and career. Let's see what exciting guests we have on our show today. Well, the Drawing Board Nation welcomes to the show, Brother Terrell, Pastor Terrell Jackson. How are you, sir? Uh, doing well. So glad to be here with my brother indeed. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. A coach, educator, man of God, husband, true leader, true father. What a pleasure it is to be here with you, brother. Oh, my brother, I was getting ready to introduce you the same way. So uh, <laughs> reciprocating those same things. A true leader, a man of God, a husband, a father, a grandfather, one yes, who's sir. laboring in the community, one who is preaching that word of God without wrath or doubting, one who is bringing that word of life, the bread of life, yes. and bringing that bread from heaven down to those who are ready to prepare themselves to partake of it and eat the whole roll. And yes. we know what that's we yes. know what that's about. So I'm glad to have you on. Now, Pastor Jackson, you are the founding pastor of Church of True Faith. And where, where is Church of True Faith located? Church of True Faith is located in Detroit, uh, 13210 West McNichols Road, uh, between Schaefer and the Lodge Freeway. Service time is at 1 o'clock. Yeah, I said 1 o'clock. You get to get your beauty rest uh, and come on out. <laughs> And, you know, here with Thus Saith the Lord, we are definitely a non-traditional church uh, with a non-traditional time. You may see me in a suit and tie, but it's come as you are. All right. Excellent. So now I have to ask the question because I know you are a wordsmith, that you break words down, that you you. So when you come to the name Church of True Faith. Now, what is true faith? True faith really exemplifies that if you're really going to go after something for God, it's not going to make human sense to you. Matter of fact, when Jesus declared the kingdom, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That word repent means to change your mind. And a lot of times whenever you go after God, especially with uh, the great statement that we represent going hard for Jesus, you really have to go hard against what you have learned thus far until you come into the kingdom of God. And that's what exemplifies true faith. Okay, and when you say you are a non-traditional church, what, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Non-traditional church just exemplifies that uh, we truly believe that you must catch the fish before you clean the fish. And a lot of times when people have been saved for so long, we can forget what a struggle it was for us to even get to the place that we are. And then for those that maybe not have went, maybe haven't went through the struggle or the different things that we see in this age, in our generation, where you have fatherlessness, you have so many people that have come from broken homes. So when they come into a setting, which is a church, and it's such a high standard for holiness and living for God, that when they walk through our doors, that they would know that we're here to love you, not judge you, because we understand from what you have came from. So a lot of times, even when it's time for service to start, we make sure that we go out of our way to greet those that, came, that come in, because you don't know what kind of situation they're coming out of. Uh, how they might be at the, the break of suicide, anything like that. So it's a no-judgment zone when they come in, but we let the Spirit of God do the transformation and not just a forceful hand. Oh, absolutely. So it sounds like it's a church where I can come in and be loved. That's right. Uh, and not just the idea of coming as I am mm -hmm. in the way I'm clothed, but coming right. as I am in spirit. That's right. Uh, no mm -hmm. matter uh, whether, you know, Paul said, I have abounded with those that have abounded. I've been high. I've been That's low. Right. But, you know, he gets to the point where he realizes that because of the love of God, his conviction, his faith, going through those trials, that he can do what? All things That's right. through, through Christ, Christ which strengthens him. him. So right. you're there as a, a, a strengthening hand, a helper, That's someone right. that you're meeting people exactly where they are and allowing the Holy Spirit to do that transformation, that work, they cause mm -hmm. them to switch systems and become into the image of Christ himself. Right. So I'm a holiness preacher, definitely. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, I yeah. declare the word of God. Absolutely. But like I like to tell people, and you know this being a coach, uh, I look at God as being a coach and not a cop. 
Meaning he's not there to regulate you in such a way to point out everything that you're doing wrong, but he just wants to encourage you and push you forward to let you know that where you are right now is not your destiny place. Okay, great. Well, I want you for just about a couple seconds. Somebody Mm -hmm. may be at the threshold of saying, you know what, I'm going to church this Sunday. And you know that struggle or that or they're going to midweek service, right. you know, coming up. And that, that struggle between making that decision. Because the struggle is not in uh, whether to do it or not. The struggle is, am I going to make the commitment and decide? So the struggle is in the decision. That's Would right. Would you agree? So, so once, much so. Yeah, once you become resolute about this is what I'm going to do, then the struggle has to cease because the struggle is between a matter of fact of your will. That's am right. Am I going to do this or am I going to do that? But once I made a decision, then Church of True Faith is a place where they can come and be fed. That's they right. They can be matured in the faith. They can receive the love of God. I know you do. You're real big on your outreach. Yes, outreach is one of the main components that I try to uh, definitely push the people that's in the pews uh, to do because uh, we even declared that God is about to get the main one saved. Uh, Who is the main one? The main one that the enemy just knows that he has under under his grasp, the one that he believes that will never see a way out. But I just declare that he's going to save the main one. And the main way that we can do that is just remember God has not counted anybody out. As long as you have warm blood in your vein, breath in your body, you better believe God has something in store for you. So even if it may be somebody that's scrolling right now, the power of a made-up mind, making that decision to go forward is the best thing you can do. So if I could just echo these sentiments, get out of neutral, it's time to get in drive because God is taking you somewhere. Absolutely. That was good. Now, here's here's my question. That was powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're doing a mighty work over there off of West McNichols, but let's 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 rewind. Let's go back, way oh, back. Oh, take me back. Yeah, take me back. Back into time. So, talk to me about Terrell the man, like, and from you being the man to the man of God to God calling you to preach, where He cultivated and grew you up. Like, talk to me about that journey. Uh, quick journey. Uh, grew up in Detroit on the west side, actually Seven Mile and Livernois. Okay. And uh, started school in public school. Uh, then we made a transition. My mother and father put me in Catholic school. And by going in both of those settings, I was able to learn uh, from the privileged side. Those that went to Jesu with me, hey, how y'all doing? Benedictine. Uh, Those were settings where we had parents that cared about our education, parents that wanted to see us be pushed forward uh, to make something out of ourselves. Not saying that public school is not that way, but once I went to public school, I seen another side of life, whether it was some of my friends that came to school, that came to school dirty, came to school hungry, and it made me appreciate actually the sacrifices that my mother and father made, but then also to get into that non-judgment zone where I actually could say, you know, it's some kids out here who haven't made the decision uh, to be in the place that they are in, but they were born in it. And that's where I began to see that there were generational curses that had to be broken. And so many of my good friends, uh, best friends, that died prematurely because of the sins of the father and so many things that they had to go up in an uphill battle that they didn't have the strategy, didn't have, as I've been preaching, a combination, the different things that God would like to implement in our lives, that it's not just the master key that opens these doors, but it's a combination lock. So I want to tell you, step up to the locker. God wants to give you the combination to unlock the doors that the enemy has tried to keep shut. All right, so let's go back. Let's unpack that a little bit because, okay. you know, I grew up in church, so I know when you say the sins of the father laid yes, on the son. Yes. But, like, break that down for those who might be listening uh, because you are saying some of your friends end up, uh, you know, exiting this life prematurely yes. because they were born maybe into a, a, broken, fam- home. To a yeah. broken home or to a family that ascribed to a certain lifestyle right. that put them at risk for, you know, uh, the proclivities of being in danger and, yes. you know, dealing with some of those habits that are formed, 
in order to obtain money where they were either uh, drug dealing or hustling in the streets mm-hmm. or, you know, robbing and stealing or whatever, whatever it may have been mm-hmm. or just even like geographically where they lived, yes. you know, made them predisposed to be exposed to violence. So, mm-hmm. like, what did you mean by or is that what you meant by uh, when you say in the sins of the father were laid on the son? Like, break that down for our listeners. Well, the best way that I could ever uh, really uh, make that transparent is is that every male on my block that was in my age category, the only ones that graduated was the ones that had fathers in their house. Okay. Me along with uh, two of my other friends. But the ones that didn't have fathers in their house, you know, subsequently, they, they didn't graduate. Um, you know, I believe uh, potential is something that you must put a mandate on. Okay. And that's one thing a good father does. They won't let you settle. They will make sure that they push you ahead, let you know that, you know, you, 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 you're going to get out of here. You're going to do what you need to do to become a man. And so many times, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, mothers cannot raise sons, but a son will have a void whenever his father is not in his life because fathers are those that are the secures, the protectors. Uh, we have some strong women out here, but we have learned that because of the load that women are carrying, uh, especially black women, that they are dying from heart attacks. It's only so much that a woman's heart can actually take as it concerns what she sees and the different things that we go through, even with the tragic death of the rapper that just took place. It's nothing like the death that we see in our community where so many of our loved ones, people that the world has counted out by looking at the stereotype of what they believe black males are. But I believe the only way that that can truly be changed is when we truly unpack the sins that we have probably took on uh, unknowingly that have tried to keep us in that limited place. Okay, and I would ask such as what? Well, in my life, my dad was in my life. Uh, matter of fact, we're about to celebrate uh, 50 years, 50 years that they have been married. Oh, congr- uh, actually, con- it was. Wait, uh, let's pause right there. Congratulations, <laughs> mom and dad. Yeah. 50 years in. Oh, yes, I think Lord. Joshua was trying to say, what were you trying to say, Josh? Oh, Josh was like, oh, no, hold on, dad. Wait, something else. <laughs> okay, no, well, go ahead. But what I mean by that, they just celebrated uh, 50 years on March 23rd. Okay. And I remember once I became a man, one of the main things I asked my dad, I mean, what told my dad, I said, I'm just glad you stayed. Reason being is because there are a lot of things that happen to men along this journey called life that sometimes you just want to walk away, you know, from all of the pressure. But when you stand up to the plate, uh, matter of fact, you can't hit a home run till you step up to the plate. You must understand that, you know, it's some things that may wear you out, but because of who God is, he will direct our path. One of the main things that took place when man fell in the garden, the first words that came out of his mouth to God after the fall, I was afraid. And a lot of men nowadays are scared to, to, to say that out of their own mouth because we're taught that I'm not never scared, but also, oftentimes I believe every man feels the fear if they're going to be a failure. No man wants to fail, and that's what the enemy is trying to torment men with, the failure of being exactly what God created them to be. Absolutely. I think especially when there's not a, a mile marker ahead of you. Yeah, you need a template. Uh, yeah, That's right. when you when you haven't seen it successfully done. Right, show me. Yeah, it it it, it becomes difficult to navigate because, as you know, being a mm-hmm. pastor. Uh, when you're building capacity in other people or you're stretching them like that, that's mm-hmm. an uncomfortable position. That's so, right. That's uh, right. When you said something I think is powerful, which I want somebody to go ahead and put in the comments, you said potential is something that a mandate must be put on. Yeah, And so that's when, right. when you have someone in a position where there's a mandate on on the potential that he or potentiality that he may not known was there. Right. Uh, when he doesn't have the answer, you know, mm-hmm. um, when he becomes aware of his insufficiencies, like I believe in a lot of our leadership role as men. I like, like that insufficiency. We're yeah, gonna go there. Yeah. Okay. And so I believe that when you realize that you your confidence in God is what makes you effective. You That's know? right. Um, but I think when you fall in a lot of leadership roles or capacities, this is just me. 
is that it creates this void and need to depend on God. That's right. And That's so, right. like, it was never designed in a way for you to lead this family or to lead the church or to lead uh, even yourself uh, without the assistance of God's direction. Amen. Uh, that word insufficiency, uh, at offering time, I make sure we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, okay. where it simply states that God is able to make all grace abound, abound towards toward you. That ye always have an all sufficiency in all things yeah. and may abound to every good work. Yes, sir. So with that being said, uh, the insufficiency that we may find ourselves in is us truly not relying on that grace from God. What is grace? I like to give this definition. Okay. What God can only do that you couldn't do for yourself. So that's where the total dependency relies on a man knowing that you must go to God. Meaning, my son here, he will tell me his needs. My wife will tell me her needs. Grandkids will tell me some of the things that they need. Daughter, tell me what they need. And when a man has that great pressure upon him, he must know that he has a direct line with God. And there's no reason to be afraid. Because remember, when God was looking for Adam uh, in the garden, when he hid himself and said, I was afraid, he was afraid to go into that time with God right. so he could talk to him in the cool of day. So if it may be a man out there that has been battling with his walk with God, once again, God is not trying to be a cop to tell you your vibe. Violation. He wants to coach you forward. And the only way you can get that is have your set time with God before anybody gets up so you can really know on the course of the day that you need to start your day. That's good. So, you know, brothers are, are generally very literal. You yes, know, sir. You, yes, sir. You give yes, brothers sir. a set of directions, you know, uh -huh. tell me to turn left. Mm -hmm. At the Popeyes, tell me to move forward, you know, mm -hmm. head north 40 meters, turn right. So, like, give me some very practical steps, particularly because you were saying arise early, get into your, you know, your prayer time or your conversation with God. It might be a brother say, you know, Pastor Jackson, I don't even really, like, know how to talk to God, you yes. know, or nobody has taught me to pray. What would you say to that brother? That's a religious mind state, you know, because there's no just one way to pray. Okay. God wants to hear from you. He just wants to know that you can push everything to the side just to hear from him. Uh, many of my steps to get to where I am today, God listened to me even when I was outside of his will. Uh, many will say from the religious mentality that God doesn't hear a sinner's prayer. God only holds you accountable for what you know. If you don't know how to do it, you can talk to him like you're talking to your friend. And he will understand just where you are, are at because he is the interpreter of your heart. Your heart. Amen. So that's the main thing. Just give it to him from the heart. Let him know, Lord, I, I don't have it all together, Lord. Teach me. Matter of fact, I like to tell men, sometimes you got to call out God before you learn how to call on him. Meaning, David even said it, are you not the God? He made sure he laid down who God was. And I remember when I was bound, when I was still smoking marijuana, still in the streets, I say, Lord, if you really are who you are, deliver me. I love we, but I love you more. Hey, here I am. And sure enough, it was a process. Sometimes you have to go through the process of being a hypocrite. But the key is you must keep God's name in your mouth. And then he says certain things he would do for his name's sake. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that it's the washing of the word. Or That's that right. Word, the word comes to purify, to That's make right. holy, to sanctify. Mm -hmm. And so that just means you got to keep the word of God in your mouth. And declare you know, it. Declare it. Unapologetically. What is Joshua Actually, yeah. that's what uh, going hard for Jesus is. Okay. That you're going to declare his word even in your insufficiency is because sooner or later he's going to do it for his name's sake. Because if his name is attached to you right. and you and you constantly lifting him up, he's going to have to save you because he's not going to have his name attached to something that is not like him. Right. No, that's good. So let's talk about the redemptive quality of telling our story, right? So like even though you mentioned that Hey, you, you were in the streets, mm -hmm. you know, smoking marijuana, like to not leave it there. The redemptive quality is 
the more that you kept speaking the word, the more that you kept getting into your war, That's word, right. the more you surrounded yourself in a community of faith, That's the right. more you got around people who were where you were ascribing to go, not mm-hmm. to judge you, but to say, Mark the perfect man. Let me figure out, you know, who's walking this walk in such a way that exemplifies the life that I desire. Like who's living this Christ walk, you know, and I and you got among believers that were doing that, right? Correct. And then another thing, uh, it's going to be a season of isolation when you give your life to the Lord. The same people that you used to hang with, when you make that decision to go in a different direction, you're going to be isolated from them. Mm -hmm. Then when you come on the scene and it may be a church where you may just be in a, in a place where uh, of confinement and you don't feel at liberty to mingle with these different ones that are in the place that you're looking to go. You have to just hold on to God's unchanging hand and trust the process. And the more you do that, he will begin to show you just how it is done. And um, even when it came to me, uh, the process of how I was saved, Um, I had to do it by praise. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. You will never inhabit the body that you live in, the house you live in, because the word inhabit means to permanently live. So that means that when you lift up a praise to God, he permanently lives in that praise. And what happens when he lives in that praise, that's his presence, the presence of the Lord, produces joy. That means the heaviness of what you're going through in the world, you are released from. Then the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's when you get the fuel to be able to live this life and be able to declare it. Because once again, closed mouths don't get fed. God is looking for your influence. Everybody that's on social media right now, there's somebody following you. You have a sphere of influence, whether you want to believe it or not. And that's what the enemy is after, because he knows that as you go, many will follow you. Absolutely. So considering all of those things, uh, Terrell the man, Mm -hmm. then Terrell the man of God. Mm-hmm. Then Terrell, the husband. Yes, sir. Yeah, talk to me now. I know every time I see you and your beautiful wife together, man, yeah, she's she always is beautiful. Hey, yeah, man, always, hey, you know, undergirding you, man. Always, yes, you know, standing strong with you. Mm-hmm. And what I love about it, man, is you guys are in this thing doing ministry together. As yes, one. teamwork makes the dream work. Yes, sir. Uh, the Bible simply declares, "He that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtain a favor from the Lord." Uh, like I like to joke around and what I mean so dearly, even for my beautiful wife to choose me, it is a direct sign that God has favored me. All right. Uh, the favor of God is something that you don't worry about. Everybody might not understand it. They may even look at you as being overconfident. But God wants you to understand that when he gives you a wife, that is a token of his favor on your life to complete your life. Matter of fact, when he created Eve for uh, Adam, he put him to sleep. So I want to say any man that is not married, you still sleep. You want to say you woke, but you need to wake up to find out who God has sent you to be that help me. And that word help me means strong help. Your wife is a strong help. She's Absolutely. the encourager. Yeah. She's that audible voice that will speak on behalf of God to get you out of your slumber. Any man, we never will marry a woman that nags. So when we get a wife and she speaks up, that's us knowing, oh, wait a minute, God's trying to get my attention. And the same thing is when she gives you what God wants you to have because even, uh, it's, it's it's a known study, men with wives live longer. Because they are that 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 voice that God has given us to be that strong help. Oh yeah, there's a power, there's a wisdom, yes, there's yes. some encouragement and some sometimes some some correction, some change. Yes, oh yes, yeah. that's right. Oh no, right. absolutely. And what I love about God is that we become compliments to one another. One. Yeah. Yes. And the Bible we beca- says yeah, one. Yeah, become compliments to one another and we become one, no longer twain, that's but right. one flesh. So it it is impossible for your wife to be weak. That's right. Because 
she is that strong help. Strong help. And so uh, one of the things that we tackle, and we we can we can we can uh, broach this t- this topic, but Come on. when we mm-hmm. talk about biblical uh, mm-hmm. submission, yes, sir. and when we talk about what that really looks like inside of the household. Now, this is something that I tell brothers in the marketplace, mm-hmm. or we, you know, those are church terms, but in the world, yes, sir. Um, is that you have to know you cannot apply the familial structure mm-hmm. to your outside dealings with other individuals because that woman is not your wife. That's right. <laughs> you know? That's right. And mm-hmm. when you talk about the family structure and how God set it up, like and the man and woman to be compliments to one another, man mm-hmm. accountable to God, you know, a uh, woman accountable to the man that submitted to God, mm-hmm. and then the children accountable to both parents. Like you cannot take that mindset mm-hmm. onto into your workplace. That's right. That's right. The main reason is is because the Bible clearly says yes, sir. that women must submit to their own husband. Absolutely. And you can give people uh, a support uh, and words of encouragement. But the relationship that God gave man and woman as husband and wife is divine. When I say divine, that means it is strictly straight from God. A gift, actually, something that we must prioritize, keep as something that is holy, because when you get a bloodline that is truly representing the kingdom of God, is something that is so special that when people come around you, as I always tell them, as being true kingdom citizens, we are not thermometers. We don't come into an atmosphere and monitor what the temperature is, but we are Holy Ghost thermostats. And when you truly have a love that is divine from God, wherever you go, people should be able to feel that divine climate that God has bestowed upon, that holy marriage that will show others what life is all about. Well, now that we're here, you might as well go ahead and give your wife a shout out because I know she's. she's oh, amen. Yeah. Yeah. I love you, baby. Uh, my beautiful thing, my lemon drop. Amen. So, so glad she's my bodyguard as well, my armor bearer, the one that sees what I can't see. So, when I need to be tuned in and understand what is going on, she can come in and impart what God has shown her. Awesome. Now let's talk about Pastor Terrell Jackson, the father. Let's talk about the father, Terrell Jackson. Like, break that down for me, sir. How many children do you have? I have four. Uh, When I married my wife, I married two other children. That's Marvin and Brittany. Uh, When it comes to the first tier of parenthood, uh, when it comes to them being older, uh, they come to church because they they know it's real. Uh, I have a problem when it's a pastor and their children don't come to church because there's some void there. Uh, don't get me wrong. It could be situations where the enemy is trying to keep them outside of the church. But I believe that when you have truly ruled well your house, that your children will fall in line. And when it comes to my, my children, uh, the ones that I married when I married my wife, I mean, to see what they are are accomplishing right now is something that I love because it shows me when I see them in church on Sunday and my grandchildren in church, it shows me that they have got the picture. They understand that this is real. Uh, the, The testimonies that they have of what God has done in their life, you know, by me ruling well, is something that they would defend with everything that they have. Now, when it comes to uh, the two younger children, they, they, they haven't seen me in work as much as the, uh, they have. Uh, they're growing to appreciate it as they get older. With my daughter about to graduate next year. Wow. Uh, she even did... Uh, Graduating next year. Yeah, you know how time go by. I'm telling you. That's one of the good things, too. When you're a father... God gives you a timeline to show you how much time is going by. When you don't have kids, you can actually fool yourself that as much time is not really going by. But once again, with her graduating next year, it's a direct sign even to her. She understands truly who I am, uh, what's the standard I have for her, and that, you know, she's going to be a a mighty woman of God, going to get a good husband that's going to love her all the days of her life. And I believe that when you show this and you live it, it's something that they can grab hold of to and and have that expectation for. When it comes to my son here uh, being by my side now, 
Uh, I want him to always know that I'm about this life. Uh, I live this life. Uh, I walk it like I talk it. It's not something that I'm just preaching on Sunday or someday. All right. It's something I'm doing all day, every day in a, in a true fulfilled way. And um, I believe it motivates him because he has seen the power of God. Uh, And that's what we must do when it comes to being a father. You must be that protector, provider, and encourager uh, to the point that what they understand that no matter what they're going through, that you have the solution because God is feeding you and you're talking to him in the cool of the day, doing what needs to be done. Awesome. Now, this question is for Joshua. Joshua, question, man, what is the coolest thing about your dad that you love, man? He's a pastor. You think that's that's the coolest thing about him, that he's a pastor? <laughs> what do you like about him being a pastor? Um, sharing the word of God. Sharing the word of God? Man, that's awesome, Josh. Do you think one day that you plan on uh, being a pastor? Yes. You do? Okay, cool, man. Will you be right by your dad's side, you know, holding his towel, being his armor bearer now, and that mantle to fall on you? Plus, you have your own mantle that God will give you. That's the wonderful thing about uh, my pastor was just preaching about Elijah and Elisha. Mm-hmm. And what was awesome about it is Elijah, Elisha wanted more than mm-hmm. just what Elijah had to give. That's true. Because he asked for a double, double portion, portion. That's right. of his spirit. Yes. And so not only did he want what Elijah had, mm-hmm. he wanted what? More. That's right. And and that's one of the things. I'm glad you touched on that topic Mm -hmm. when it talks about the impartation. If it's one thing that men have lacked is the transference of the blessing. Uh, When you look at the different struggles that we have went through uh, with the absentee fathers that's in homes, you have children, men, that have never received the impartation of the blessing. If we look biblically, that was one of the biggest things that sons look forward to is the blessing of the father upon their life. So let's let's pause right there. So uh, I understand when we talk about impartation, I mm-hmm. understand what you're talking about, the blessing. I understand the role of the father uh, mm-hmm. unto the son uh, and how the son was awaiting or the sons were awaiting That's right. for the father mm-hmm. to impart that blessing. But when we talk about impartation, break that down for me. Impartation simply means that there is a certain anointing on our life. When I say anointing, there's a certain grace, something that God can only give that you can't do yourself that is transferable. Just as the curse is transferable, we can see what broken homes have produced in our community. So when a father is there to lay hands upon his son, declare what he will be, what shall flow that was in the father's life to the son's life, it really manifests because this is something that God wanted to do from the beginning. He said, be fruitful, multiply. He wanted us to subdue the earth. And the only way that can be done is the transference, what I'm talking about, the impartation upon our children that we can bless them, bless these men, these men so when they begin to grow as real men that they will have the confidence to be able to reign as what God has ordained us to reign in. I look at also, uh, even in churches, uh, uh, pastors that won't give out that blessing. It's something that the enemy has tried to do to stop what God is really wanting to release through a man. We have that power. We can truly impart that blessing on our children. We can do it spiritually because nowadays there's too many spiritual bastards. I thank God that the fathers that I have had in the faith that— uh, no matter how things worked out, I had a daddy at home, you know, so uh, even if things didn't work out the way I wanted them to work, I still got a daddy, and my daddy's name is True Man. To show you how God is a God of order, uh, whenever day his birthday falls on, the whole family's birthday fall on that day. Uh, my dad's birthday fell uh, on the 15th this year, so I, I guarantee my mother's birthday was on the same day, uh, uh, my, my, not the same day, but the same day. Uh, then it's my birthday, and then it's my brother's birthday. So God is a God of order. When I gave my life to the Lord, gave it on my granddaddy's birthday. Well, my daddy gave his life to the Lord when I went and ministered to him. He did it on his only grandchild's birthday. So when you, when you see God's order, 
you can definitely see the transference of the blessing, but we have to make sure we reestablish that so we can reign as God truly. Oh, it sounds like y'all turning these birthdays into revivals. That's what it's like. Hey, I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> no, I mean, but, yes, no, it, it's definitely whenever the family is gathered, man, uh, to break bread and to share the word. And one of the things that uh, we were talking about, and I would pitch this to you, and want, I'm interested in your thought, is that not every pastor or preacher is a spiritual father. True. And so mm-hmm. when we talk about a spiritual father, A, holding no gender, because within the spirit right. there's no that's, bond, that's no right. free, Jew, no Greek, mm-hmm. male, nor female. So I heard some mothers saying, you know, well, I want to speak this blessing over my son or speak this blessing mm-hmm. over, you know, my child. So when it comes to spiritual things, mm-hmm. uh, there is no gender as it relates there. That's right. Right. So you can still, because you can speak that word over your sons and daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, you can declare the word of God. You can lay hands on them. That's you right. can anoint them. These are these are our, our part of what impartation that's uh, right. Is, is a part of. These are some of the exercise mm-hmm. or the activities of impartation, namely it being the laying on of hands and declaring the word of God. Amen. My mother uh, truly uh, was the backbone of our family spiritually, and she declared over my life continuously uh, the blessings of God. She did it over my father's life. She did it over my brother's life. And even right now, with my brother being in jail for murder, uh, he has been calling me for the last two weeks, and our relationship hadn't been the best because the enemy didn't want us to form the way that we should have. But the reality of it is, God being a God of order, prayers of the righteous truly availing much, a mother can always pray for her child. Like my brother said and I said, we survived off our mother's prayers. Absolutely. And what happened, because she believed in God, she told me when I was in college and I was facing a a very serious case, she said that uh, I have carried the family long enough. God told me that you was going to get your daddy and your brother saved. And she stood upon that thing. And it happened. So if there's a mother out there and you may say, well, uh, my my child's father is not in his life, and and what can I do? You can continue to declare the word of God, just as uh, Brother Ebron just said. You have the authority, and God wants to reestablish his covenant with your family. I believe that the male is very important in, in the family, even when Solomon had the two women that were prostitutes and one of their babies came up dead. Absolutely. The reason why it was so important for them to have the male child is because the curse would be broken. No longer would they have to be prostitutes, but that male child would rise and he would be able to care for them, that they would no longer have to operate and fend for themselves. And that's the reality of what God wants to do now. He's raising up a generation that is ready to take on this challenge. Uh-huh. They just have to get the information. They just need to get that God is ready to do a great work. All they have to do is trust him. Right. Well, there's been a there's always been a challenge against the male child. Come period. on now. Come you know, on. And Come so on. Uh, when it came to the enemy wanting to hurt the family, That's he right. bound and he captured the women and children. That's right. But when it came to him wanting to uh, attack the man, scripturally it says kill everything that pisseth against the wall. So it has been to bound and keep captive the women and children. Hence, you know, uh, I'll be down in Florida in a Mm -hmm. couple weeks with Bishop Jake's woman now art loose. Yes, sir. But when it came to the man, he wanted to kill the man. That's right. And so we know that the man child was called the Zira, right? Mm -hmm. And so he was the, the male seed where the enemy would bruise his heel but mm. Jesus Christ would crush his head. Come on now, the and so, seed of the woman, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's it. So when we when we talk about how important the, the man-child is mm-hmm. in the lives and the succession of how our communities go in the future, that's right. uh, it is about equipping that man-child because one of the greatest forms of correction yes, sir. is direction. That's right. And so I feel like there are tons of people who want to correct the issue mm-hmm. that they see within our young men mm-hmm. by bringing more attention or being a cop, bringing more attention to mm-hmm. his faults. Right. But they are empty of direction. That's right. So he knows in that moment, believe me, you, 
that he knows in that moment that he does not want to live the current life that he's living. He That's may right. want better, but there are very few people who are invested enough to actually give him some direction that's going to lead him to that light that pe that we're preaching about. And that's the that's the main component. See, uh, the enemy has tried to strip everybody of their confidence okay. uh, in life. Uh, it could be the woman who is in an abusive relationship. Everybody can say, well, why is she in that relationship? Because the enemy's job, once he has put you in a place where he has stripped you of your confidence, then you lose your mobility. That's where stagnation comes in. So when you look at everything that men have went through, uh, children are going through, uh, even mothers are going through, the enemy wants to really strip them of their confidence mm -hmm. so they won't be able to move out of the place that they're in. But that's what the Word of God does. The Word of God is life. The Word of God is that very fuel that you need, even when it seems like you're on empty, to believe that God can do just what he said he'd do. The Bible says that hope that is seen, why do you yet hope for it? Right. So a lot of people say, well, why can, how, how can I have hope when I see what I see right here? It's because God can do all things but fail. So when I look at what's going on, even with uh, children, especially male children, when Moses was going to be born. Absolutely. And they heard that it was going to be one to rise up. It was a decree sent out to kill all the male children. When Jesus was about to be born, a decree went out to kill all of the male children because that is the very place where the change will actually take place. So I will tell a mother once again, you keep declaring what you want to see over your child's life. I'm a living witness that if my mother, when she was giving me this message, I was smoking a blunt in front of her, listening to gospel music, and she was literally like, listen to this song. This is what God showed me. She didn't care what she seen in the natural. She held on to what God told her. So I believe that the woman is the main component that is to be the encourager to let us know that God is up to something. And then once we grab it, hallelujah, we are to set things on fire, Holy Ghost fire, that is. Yeah, to go hard for Jesus. To go hard for Jesus. That's so, right. So let so let me ask you. Uh huh. And just a just and this this is kind of a a blanketed blanketed question, mm -hmm. but what is the answer? So while you know definitely it resonates with me because I have that foundation. Correct. And so everything that you're saying, scriptures are connecting for me. Mm -hmm. You're speaking the word. It, it 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 infuses, it lights on fire, the very fiber of my being, because the word of God, what? It's quick, powerful, sharp right. to it. So, so like all of those things, but a lot of our youth, they don't have that foundation. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the answer is to bridge the gap? Well, the Bible clearly lets us know. You can prophesy, you can have all of the gifts, but if you don't have love, you just have, it's just tinkling symbols. You're making noise. One thing I have learned with the young today, they know who are fake. They know who have a pseudo image, a fake image of what love is. But if you truly reach out to them with a genuine heart and truly are doing the work of God with pure love, pure charity, then they understand truly what it is. Uh, one of the biggest mandates that God gave us was to care for the widow, care for the fatherless. And that's where the work begins. But we're in a place now where so many people are on the hamster wheel going fast as they can, but going nowhere, that they forget what God's main ingredient is. He wants us to, to, to reach out to those that are brokenhearted, those that are blind, those that are in jail. That is our job. And the more people see us doing the work, the more people see us going, the more they will want to be a part of what the church is. But as long as we're meeting, eating, and retreating, pointing the finger, uh, all of these different things that has grown to make people despise the church, nobody's going to want to be a part of it. But I believe that everybody that has come to our church, we don't have uh, really founding members, but those that are there, and they came here because they wanted a, a taste of what God is. They wanted to see 
what it was all about to truly trust God. And to trust God with no results is literally uh, foolishness. God is going to back up whatever he's involved in. And that's what I do. I put it all on God to see him do just what his word says he would do. And when we see the results together, we can glorify him in just that same manner. Oh, yeah, it sounds like some, some mountains are being brought low. Yeah. Some valleys are being right. exalted. That's the crooked right. made straight, the rough made smooth, mm-hmm. and then all flesh shall be gathered together, what? To see his glory. That's right, and that's what people want to see. They want to see results. How, how am I coming to church every week and I'm still in the same position? Uh, this has just been a magnificent march. We're in an awesome April right now. All right. And I believe that the best is yet to come, but it's for those that would dare to believe. I, you gave an analogy for the person that said, I'm going to church, I'm going to church. But the power of a made-up mind says that I must do it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It's a made-up mind. You know, you must choose to rejoice. It's not something that just happens. Even when he say the garment of praise, your garments have to be put on. This is not something like the Jetsons. You're getting dressed. You need God to move, but you have to do something. All right, I like that. And the baseline of it is is that it dynamically works together, which That's means right. God has done his part. And now it's up for us to to do our part. Faith without works is dead. Being alone. And so when it comes down to shifting mindsets and moving paradigms and, Mm -hmm. you know, really switching systems. That's right. You know, you have the world system and then you have God system. And then you become aware of your identity uh, when you become a Christian now. This is a new thing. You know, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And, you know, the old folks used to say, uh, I looked at my hands, and my hands looked new. Yes. I looked at my feet, and they did, too. Yes. Yeah, I understood exactly what they were meaning because their perspective had changed. Yes. But we have to understand that this is a marathon and not a sprint. That's right. I believe the enemy to our lives is, the enemy to delayed uh, success is instant gratification. Uh, You can never look at something that happens immediately as truly being success. You have to go through what you have to go through. One of the biggest things that caused the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and all of the philosophers to truly not be receptive to Jesus Christ is because they wanted to see something physically that represented a kingdom. They wanted to see all of the trickers. They wanted to see a king that was born in a magnificent palace, not in a manger. They wanted to see a a king who truly had all kind of chariots and everything that went along with prosperity. So when they seen him, they're like, no, you couldn't dare be a Messiah. Is this not the carpenter's son? So with all of this being said, God knew that he had to come in a simplistic form for everybody that felt like they were counted out to feel that they were counted in because he came in that lowly place. Amen. Amen. And I just believe the more we understand that we have a Savior that has truly borne our shame, then we can declare he became poor that I might be rich. Until you get that. You will never understand why he came in such a lowly fashion. He wanted us to know no matter what you have been through, no matter what uh, bloodline you came from, there is change for you in the blood of Jesus. This is April, right? It is. This is when we celebrate the death, burial, and Resurrection. resurrection of our Savior. And there is power in the blood to regenerate no matter what you have been born in to let you know that you can truly be a child of God. What, what I love about the Word of God, what I love about Jesus Christ himself is that what he's done in the redemptive work of the cross, like, that's it. That's It's finished. And it's finished. And I think we spend a lot of time as people struggling in our humanity mm-hmm. when the love of God that's shed abroad in your heart and in my heart, it is there to cleanse us, and it has made us right. That's right. Now, the decisions that what we have to do is we have to begin to practice this thing yes. so that we get better and better at it yeah, until the image of God be formed in us. Yes. But like you said, some of the religious ideas about 
you know, the the, the piety of it mm -hmm. uh, and kind of the different structures uh, we have, um, you know, begin to put too much stress on, I won't just say clean living because there is a way that seems right. You know, yeah, I got that's that. Right. But it is about a maturation, a that's maturity right. in that's the That's right. Mm -hmm. And those who are mature are supposed to bear Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, sin, the the weakness of, of, of those who are not. That's right. They're supposed to cover them and indoctrinate them That's and right. to teach them. Because when we redirect, and this I'm really big on this, uh -huh. when we redirect and correct someone, it is about giving them that next step in direction, That's not right. making them to feel condemnation. So being that you are the pastor of Church of True Faith located on West McNichols, we have about two minutes left. Okay. I want you to just speak to the people and then after that, we'll close up and we'll round this thing out. But I appreciate you, my brother, for coming on. It takes me back to it doesn't matter where we see each other, whether it's in Kroger's, yes. whether it's, you know, when uh, I was at Cornerstone and we yes, would sir. talk. Like it was just always about breaking the bread of life, the word, and uh, in, in peace and parcel, just taking a portion of revelation because it is that revealed truth that empowers us to be effective. So That's go ahead, right. my brother. Why don't you speak to the people? If there's one thing that I would tell anybody that's tuned in today, it's not by accident. If there's one thing that God is ready to do in your life is to take you where you could have never took yourself. The enemy wants to wear you out. He wants you to believe that this is it. It's over. But the year has just began. God wants you to know that he is for you more than he can ever be against you. The enemy has told you lies. He has been pillow talking with you day and night to make you believe that you cannot do more. God said that he so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Practicing sin is this simple. It's when you rehearse the curse instead of rehearse the verse. What do I mean by that? Get in the word. Try God's word. His word is life. And what his life produces is what the enemy cannot stop. So what am I saying? You're unstoppable. All you have to do is trust God. Take him at his word. Jesus, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. In Hebrew, right means mercy. So if he's at the mercy hand of the Father, daily making intercession on your behalf, what is he saying? Mercy upon that life. Father, have mercy upon them. And because he has mercy upon you, I declare the mercy of God over your life in such a rich fashion that when God is done with you, all shall see just what his handiwork looks like. I love you. Most of all, God loves you too and bless you. All right. Thank you. And as you all know, I am the host, the founder of the Drawing Board Podcast. Your future is not before you. It is not behind you. It is where? It is within you. Yes. God bless you, Pastor Jackson. Thank you for coming on. What a Joshua, pleasure it was, thank sir. you for coming on, sir. And to everyone, where can they find Church of True Faith again? Once again, it's 13210 West McNichols Road in Detroit, Michigan, between Schaefer and the Lodge Freeway service time is at 1 o'clock. We're looking to see you and your family blessed. All right. God bless you all. All right, man. Thank you, my oh, brother, yeah. for having me. Not a problem. Oh, man, what a blessing it is, man, to be here. I pray somebody heard something that would change the very course of their life. Oh, yeah.